Believe it or not, summer is just around the corner. Luckily, Armorall, America's most trusted auto appearance brand, has what your car needs to get that perfect summer shine. Plus, now through May 31st, we'll give you $5 for every $20 you spend on Armorall products. That means car wash pods, protectant, tire shine, you name it. Find out how to get your $5 rebate at Armorall.com. Armorall, less work, more clean. Terms apply. This week on C SPAN's Lectures in History podcast, a class on the U.S. auto industry mavericks from the post World War II era through the present day. University of Central Florida professor Yannick Mikowski discusses the successes and failures of people such as Harley Earl, Preston Tucker, John DeLorean, and Elon Musk. All right. So today we're studying the post-World War II domestic scene. In the last class, we looked at the the surging economy of the post-World War II era and suburbanization. And today, what I want to look at is cars in the post-World War II era. And I especially want to look at what I call the Mavericks, uh, Maverick, a Maverick car designer and Maverick automakers, automakers who tried to establish independent companies outside the big three, who, Mavericks who thought outside the box, thought unconventionally. And so I want to look at their impact, what, what happened to them, their influence on the field of uh, the, the, the post-World War II auto industry. And, you know, if, if America had a symbol in the post-World War II era, it would have to be the automobile. I mean, Americans love their cars. They're, they're, they're big. Uh, Europeans even make fun of them. They call them yank tanks. And there's a reason that cars, American cars anyways, have the look and the shape and the size that they do. And a lot of it has to do with one automobile designer, one sort of maverick autom- automobile designer. And I want to look at him today. And um, I want to start by sort of in a nutshell, looking at some of the reasons why cars were so important and how that was reflected in in post-World War II society and in the economy. So I've listed four basic reasons why uh, the demand for cars surged and the impact that cars had in the uh, post-World War II era. First of all, the idea of pent-up demand. Um, You had the Great Depression, and we looked at that earlier in this course, and people had trouble buying necessities during the Great Depression, let alone cars, let alone luxury cars, and we saw a lot of automakers just falling like 10 pins in a bowling alley during the Great Depression. We looked at the Duesenberg, uh, for example. So you didn't have a lot of demand for cars in the 1930s, and so you add to that during World War II, a lot of the factories had to convert to production of military vehicles, tanks, planes, trucks, jeeps. In fact, the jeep was really the only new vehicle produced during World War II, and that was not a civilian vehicle, it was a military vehicle. So you have the Great Depression plus World War II. You have essentially 15 years of pent-up demand for automobiles. And whatever car you had at the start of the war, you were stuck with until the war ended. So by the end of the war, Americans were hungering for new vehicles. And it really wasn't fun to drive during World War II either. Um, There was a 35 mile per hour speed limit to conserve gasoline and to conserve rubber because Japan during World War II had captured about 90% of the world's natural rubber making capacity when it invaded Southeast Asia. Um, So uh, there was a tremendous demand for new cars and exciting cars and fast cars after the war, a demand that had been suppressed for, when you add it up, about 15 years. So that was one factor that made cars very important after World War II. Another, we looked at suburbanization in the last class, and cars facilitated suburbanization. They accelerated suburbanization. You needed cars, if you didn't rely on public transportation, you needed cars to get from your home to your place of work in the city, and then back to your bedroom community to, to, to sleep at night. And then another trend you saw in the post-World War II era is businesses started to crop up in suburbs. So suburbs became a place where you not only lived, but also worked. You saw all kinds of businesses cropping up in, in suburbs, um, franchises like McDonald's, 
um, hotel, motel chains like, like Holiday Inn started in, in Memphis in, in 1952. Drive-in theaters, the, the lore of drive-in theaters and cars looms really large in, in the 1950s. So cars and suburbanization went hand in hand in, in the post-World War II era. There, there, there was a real complementary relationship there. And then in 1952, the country elected a new president, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Interesting backstory to him. He's, he was a West Point graduate, graduated in 1915. And then four years after he graduated in 1919, he accompanied an army convoy that went from the West Coast to the East Coast. And that journey took 62 days. And it appalled Eisenhower. I mean, he was really, in a lot of ways, disgusted by it. He saw army vehicles getting stuck in mud. That was the condition of roads back then. Just really crude, primitive pathways for vehicles to, to travel on. And he recognized that this was a real problem. It was a problem for the economy because it hampered economic development. When, when you have transportation networks that are that crude, it, it, um, it impedes the transportation, the movement of goods and services. He also, as a military man, recognized that represented a threat to national security. I mean, in case of an emergency, you couldn't move military vehicles very easily along those kinds of, of roadways. So I think that experience had a formative impact on him. It's, it, it's stuck in the back of his mind. And then during World War II, he was in Europe, and in Germany he saw the Autobahn. The, the network of roads, the freeways in, in Germany, along which vehicles travel very fast. And he was very impressed by that. So I think those two experiences combined led him to be a big advocate of better roads in the U.S. And in 1956, he signed the Interstate Highway Act, which set up the interstate highway system, which gave America really the most impressive roadway system in the whole world. So when you're traveling along, you'll sometimes see these blue signs that are silent tributes to the Eisenhower interstate system, the five stars symbolizing Eisenhower being a, a five-star general. And Eisenhower was a fiscal conservative, but he, he, he didn't like spending the, the government's money. He liked trying to achieve a, a, a balanced budget, and he, he achieved three, actually, while he was president. But he thought having a interstate system and the huge government spending that went along with it. It was, a, it was the largest public works project in history and it went on for decades after, after the 1950s. Um, but he thought this was important. It was important for economic stimulation. It provided jobs in terms of building the roads, but it also facilitated the movement of goods and services, north, south, east, west. It promoted tourism. Americans could get to cities and parks and, and recreational sites, but it also helped with national security. I mean, in case of an emergency, like a nuclear attack, which was a threat in the 1950s, it could help evacuate cities quickly, and it could help move military vehicles quickly along, along the freeways. So this was a, 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 a uh, development in the 1950s that, that went hand-in-hand hand with the importance of automobiles. And then... In the last class, I talked about how television changed the shape of homes by eliminating the need for porches. And you could see an, the impact of cars also in home architecture. If you look at homes that were built in the post-World War II era, based on what I said in the last class as well as in this class now, you could see that this is a pre-World War II home. It's got a big porch, which is a trademark of homes built before World War II. And look at the garage. It's separate from the house, and it's sort of relegated to a inferior, sort of posterior uh, position set, set apart from the house. Um, after World War II, you see a change in that garages became attached to houses. And this was important in a functional sense because you could move, for example, groceries from your garage to your mudroom or to your kitchen without getting exposed to the elements, rain or snow. But in a metaphorical sense, it was also important because this sort of symbolized that the car was becoming a member of the family. It brought the car closer to the house. And often, like with this particular home, garages started to dominate 
the facade of homes. I mean, the garage, whether you, know, you started getting one car and two car and even three car garages, the garage was the first thing you saw when you pulled up to a house. It, it, it really was one of the defining elements of a house. And it, again, it symboled welcoming the, the, the car as sort of a member of the family. Um, I, I found these photos on the internet, which sort of expresses how the, the, the length to which uh, uh, families will try to incorporate garages in, into their house and build better and more elaborate garages uh, with a rather modest car here, shall we say, um, uh, with even an, 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 uh, a lift or an elevator to bring the car up to, to house level. So you see the importance of cars in, in home architecture as well. So the, the shapes of homes changed because of the greater impact of cars in the post-World War II era. And the shape of cars changed as well. And for this changed shape of cars, I would point to one individual who had a huge impact on the auto industry, and that was this guy. Anybody recognize him by any chance? This is Harley Earl, and he's the first maverick that I'd look, uh, like to look at. I consider him a maverick auto designer. He came to Detroit from California in 1927, and he became the head of General Motors, what was called the Art and Color section. And it soon became called the Styling section. So he was an automobile stylist. And General Motors was the first car company to have a styling section. And I actually want to go to B first here. This idea of styling. When the car first started to become popular with cars like the Model T, you had a question of which was more important, function or form. And it was actually more important that a car functioned because reliability was a problem in early cars. I mean, it mattered that a car would start and that it would run because often cars in the early years did not do that reliably. But once engineers started to iron out the kinks in cars and get them to be more reliable, automakers started to look at something else and emphasize form. In other words, what would attract consumers to an auto showroom? It was how cars looked. And even today, one of the first things that might attract us to buy a vehicle might be the look of a car. Rather, whether it works or not, or works well, its engine and, and performance might even be secondary. It's, it's the appearance that first draws our eye. And Harley Earl was very big on this concept uh, of the appearance of a car. So in your mind's eye, try to picture an antique car like a Model T. What, what does it look like to you? What are, what are its defining characteristics or elements? And I have a little picture of an older car to try to help you visualize this. This is a 1936 Duesenberg. It, it, it's a doozy. I, I taught you about that expression in, in an earlier class. And what I want to ask you about are some of the elements that you see in this car. What would you say about the, the headlights and the horn and the bumper and the tires, the spare tire including, the, the fender and the running board and the windshield, the license plate, and there's, there might be very well a luggage rack in, bolted in, in back. What, what strikes you about those elements of, of a car? I mean, how would you describe them? Any of you? Alexis? The headlights are a bit closer together than modern cars, and it doesn't look like they have mirrors. Okay, yeah. The, the, the mirror uh, came about through auto racing. They first started putting mirrors in, in auto racing, and then now we have mirrors on, on both sides. So the headlights look a lot closer together. It's almost like it, it has narrow vision, um, and they're awfully big compared to today's headlights. Uh, what else do you notice about these, these, these elements that I just mentioned? The headlights and the, and the bumpers and fender, and we've got a running board going here, and a spare tire here, the windshield. Well, what, how would you characterize those parts of, of this car or any antique car like it? What strikes you about that compared to your cars today? Julianne? Everything seems a lot bulkier and sticks out more instead of being sleek and more compact like today's cars. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. They sort of extrude 
from the car. They protrude from the car. They're, 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 they don't seem organic to the car. They, it's almost like they're, they're, they're bolted on or, or, or fixed on at the last minute. It certainly isn't aerodynamic styling. Um, and so Harley Earl set about to change the shape of these elements. And so if you look at a Harley Earl designed car, this is the Buick Y job that he designed. Look at how he changed those elements that we just talked about, that Julianne mentioned, that are sort of external to the car almost. The bumper, the headlights are now flush with the car. The radiator grill is less conspicuous. This is Harley Earl standing next to his Buick Y job. And the back of the car almost looks like a, like a, like a boat. Um, but look at how those elements are blended in. I, I juxtapose these pictures so you can see it a little better. Um, everything blends in better. They don't extrude from a car. They don't seem as external to a car. And it gives the car a more streamlined look. The headlight, the bumper is more flush with, with the car. The windshield is a little more slanted, and it gives an, an, a more aerodynamic to the, feel to the car. The fenders are, are flush with the car. The running board is gone. And legend has it that he literally erased it by looking at a, old, a picture of an old car, and he took the eraser on his pencil and just erased it. And he, he thought to himself, that's it. I'm going to get rid of running boards. And the spare tire is, is hidden as well. It totally changed the shape of, of cars. So this was one contribution of Harley Earl. Notice also the length and the height of a car. Harley Earl lengthened and lowered cars, and this had an impact on passenger comfort because it used to be in older cars that passengers in the rear seat sat right above the rear axle, and that was a very uncomfortable and bumpy position to be in. Now, since Earl lengthened and lowered cars, the passenger compartment sat cradled between the two axles, and so it was a much more comfortable ride, but it also gave the whole car a more long and streamlined feel to it. It's more aerodynamically styled. It's a much better looking car. So this was a huge contribution to the way cars look that, that Harley Earl achieved. You could really tell the difference in an antique car, an older model car, and a, the, 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 the design that Harley Earl started to impose on, on cars. So there were other contributions. I've written here, he introduced some gaudy changes as well that were less fortunate he, for example, was enamored of jet fighters. 19, the 1950s was the rocket age or the jet age. People were excited about jet engines, as was Harley Earl. He was particularly attracted by a Lockheed fighter, the P-38. And he had the idea to try to introduce some features of jet fighters to cars. So this was a car he designed. It was, it was a Buick LeSabre. And if you look at the back, he started introducing tail fins to the car. And he started introducing tail fins to higher-end cars, first like Cadillac, and then they, they, they spread to the medium car market as well, to Buicks and Oldsmobiles and, and other cars. This wasn't that good a change because it didn't serve a real function, maybe in appearance a little bit, uh, but it, it added weight to cars. It, and he added chrome to cars. It made cars more bulky and heavier. And this caught up with American cars in the 1970s during the energy crisis when, when fuel efficiency uh, became really important to, to automakers. And you can't have fuel efficiencies uh, when you have heavy cars. Uh, you, you, uh, um, you, you want more, less fuel-thirsty cars. And, and with tail fins, you, you cannot achieve that. So this was a sort of ostentatious change that Harley Earl introduced. There was another important development that Harley Earl introduced to this concept of dream cars. Today we call them concept cars. These were futuristic prototypes of automobiles that automakers would show at auto shows to use these auto shows as sort of a laboratory to gauge consumer reactions to future car prototypes, whether this car was worth putting into production if consumers reacted favorably to them, or introducing some elements of a concept car that consumers seem to like. And so I'll give you a few examples of 
of these dream cars. Harley Earl was the first to toy with this idea and introduce the idea of concept cars or, or dream cars. And this was a dream car, actually, the Buick Y job. And I have a question for you. So this is a 1936 Duesenberg. Based on this, what time frame or era do you think this Buick Y job came about? Anybody want to take a stab at the year or, or, or the decade where Earl designed this? I mean, what kind of a, what kind of a uh, car does this look like? From what decade or, or era would you think, would you place it in? Based on what you know and see about cars. Mitch? Maybe like the 1950s. Okay, good. That's exactly what I would think, the 1950s. It looks like the archetype of a 1950s decade car. But believe it or not, this is a 1938 car. So this will give you an idea of how with these dream cars or concept cars, you take a peek into the future. You anticipate trends, trends in design and styling. And so this is, this is what you do you, 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 with these dream cars. You set a forerunner to what cars will look like in, in the future. And that's very important for automakers to, to address these, these future trends and get a taste for what consumers will, will like to see in their cars in the future. I showed you the Buick LeSabre, which was also a dream car. And here's another example of a dream car. Anybody recognize this? So the idea of automobile styling spread from General Motors to other automakers. And in fact, a lot of Harley Earl trained stylists started to work for other automakers. So this is a Ford car. It's from the Lincoln division of Ford. It was actually designed by an Italian company, Ghia. And the particular stylist who came up with this concept a guy named Bill Schmidt, got the idea when he was diving. He was snorkeling or scuba diving. Does this look like any underwater animal to you? A shark, maybe? Yeah, he, he got the idea for this car from seeing a shark when he was diving underwater. But does this car look familiar to anybody? Like from a 1960s TV series? The automobile stylist George Barris got a hold of this car, and in the 1960s, ABC TV approached him about designing a car for their new TV series, Batman. So he took this car, he only had two or three weeks to do this, but he took this car out of storage and he created the Batmobile. So he used the, the, the Lincoln Futura car as a template for the, the Batmobile car. So this will give you an, another idea of how concept cars, the, which Harley Earl really pioneered, were used by automobile makers and automobile stylists. Um, so those were some of Harley Earl's contributions. He, he, really, he was a maverick stylist who pushed the envelope of automobile stylists and influenced the way cars look even up till, till today. I want to look at another maverick, and this is... A, does anybody recognize this guy? This is Preston Tucker, and I would consider him a maverick automaker. And so who was he? He was an inventor and a tinkerer, and he, he loved automobiles. He had a workshop, a machine shop in Ypsilanti, Michigan, which was outside of Detroit, is outside of Detroit. And he was enamored of speed. He loved speedy cars, and in fact, as an inventor who loved speedy cars, this was one of his inventions. He designed a tank that would go 117 miles per hour. He tried to interest the U.S. Army in it. They didn't find a use for a tank that would go that fast. But he anticipated that in the post-World War II era, Americans would hunger for new cars, new cars that would be fast, that would offer innovations, and so in December 1945, Pick Magazine, a magazine that's no longer around, had a feature on a car that he promised to put into production. He called it the Tucker Torpedo. And thousands of Americans wrote him letters expressing interest in buying this car. And the reason was that he offered all kinds of innovations in this new car. So these were innovations such as, this, was, this is Preston Tucker, with a picture of the Tucker torpedo. This is what it would look like, what he envisioned. 
So it would blend safety and engineering and performance and luxury. It would have, for example, safety features like a third eye, a cyclops eye, that would turn with your steering wheel so that you could see better when you were going around curves. It would have a pop-out windshield so that passengers wouldn't get cut by shards of glass that would shatter in an accident. It would have an uncrushable passenger compartment. It would have disc brakes, independent suspension. It would go more than 100 miles per hour. It would have more than 100 horsepower, which was pretty rare for those times to have that kind of a powerful engine. It would have a rear-mounted engine, which would allow you more room for luggage in the, the front of the vehicle. And so he advertised it like this, the first completely new car in 50 years. And he put it into production as the Tucker 48, not the Tucker Torpedo. And here's how he would advertise it, as a car with new engineering features, new safety features, and yet luxury at a medium price. So it seemed to answer this hunger, this pent-up demand that I talked about that Americans had for a completely new vehicle that would offer all these innovations that would excite consumers. And he was able to put it in production, but not mass production. He produced 51 vehicles. He had an unveiling that was met with much media fanfare. And these are workers producing the Tucker car by hand, and he was able to produce 51 of them by hand. But, oh, and he tirelessly promoted the car. He was quite a salesman. He was very energetic. He was also a very dapper dresser, as you could see. And the car came in attractive colors, an array of attractive colors. And the production vehicle had a lot of the, the features that the Tucker Torpedo promised, independent suspension, a uncrushable passenger compartment, that third Cyclops eye. It was fast. It would go 120 miles per hour with good fuel efficiency, too. It had a rear engine. But he was only able to produce 51. Why? We'll fast forward to 1988 when a film came out, Tucker, The Man in His Dream. And anybody recognize these two? This is Francis Ford Coppola, the film director. And this guy, anybody recognize? Any of you Star Wars fans? This is George Lucas. Francis Ford Coppola owns a Tucker, and he got really interested in the story of Preston Tucker. And so he directed, and George Lucas was the executive producer for this film. And here's Francis Ford Coppola's Tucker on display at his California winery. And so this was the film with Jeff Bridges in the title role as Preston Tucker. Uh, it's a great film to watch, partly because of Jeff Bridges' performance in this film. He's very effervescent. He, his personality is sort of like opening a soda bottle. He's just all excited about his car, and it takes you through the story of his developing this car, at first having the concept for the car, and then trying to put it in production. He, he emulates some of the original poses of Preston Tucker. They had replica cars made for this film, and he, promotes, he promotes the car the same way Preston Tucker did. But the film tries to explain the demise of Preston Tucker, why he was only able to produce 51 of these cars by hand. And Eddie, you said you were actually able to watch the film. What did the, the film intimate about the reason why Preston Tucker was only able to produce 51 of these cars and then he had to stop? What was the, the message behind the film? Well, like at the time, um, he came out with like all these innovations and like other the bigger three car companies were like intimidated by him coming out with the, all these like new ideas so they ended up suing him so it kind of just like took him down and barely because like there was like a law where he had to make like 51 cars in order to like keep the money that he earned or that he made to make the cars so he had to make 51 cars and then um he ended up doing that and but he still kind of like failed in the end Okay, yeah, he did fail in the end. That's, that, that's, a, that's a really good summation of what the film tries to present. In other words, the, the way the film 
goes, it plays very heavily on the conspiracy theory concepts that the big three automakers, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, felt threatened by this new, innovative car. And essentially, they kneecapped the guy. They conspired to crush Preston Tucker and drive him out of business. So that's the Hollywood story. And I've written here, really? Um, It's a good Hollywood story, but it's not good history. I mean, when it came right down to it, Tucker occupied this dime-thin sliver of the auto market, if that. I mean, 51 cars, come on. That's not, that's not a threat to your competition if you're one of the big three automakers. So I've asked here, what really doomed Preston Tucker to failure? It's the nature of the enterprise that he was trying to get into, automaking. When I talked about Henry Ford and mass production early in the course, I talked about how mass production just raised the stakes for anybody in the automobile business. To mass produce cars, you have to have huge amounts of money and capital and financial resources. It involves uh, huge factories and supply chains sometimes spread out all over the country or all over the world. It's a very complicated business. But above all, it requires money, fundraising. And this is something Preston Tucker or any maverick trying to enter the automobile business, this is something that they lack. They have real trouble raising money to enter the automaking business. And so Preston Tucker always struggled with, with fundraising. And he tried some unconventional schemes to try to raise money. For example, he sold, well, one of his mistakes was just renting such a big factory. He rented a, a, a former Dodge aircraft plant in Chicago. It was covered 93 acres. It was way too big a factory for his needs, much too expensive for him to afford. And then to try to raise money, some of these unusual schemes that he engaged in were selling accessories to the trucker car, Tucker car before the car was even available. So he was selling to dealerships radios and seat covers and luggage. These ideas, the, the, these methods, attracted the attention of the Securities Exchange Commission. And eventually, a grand jury indicted Tucker on charges of mail fraud and conspiracy to defraud the public. And there was a trial. And the jury reached its verdict. Not guilty. So, what can we conclude about Preston Tucker? He was not a fraud or a swindler. I mean, he did have a genuinely innovative car that in many ways was decades before its time. He was a champion of seatbelts long before seatbelts became a standard in the industry. And, and other things, the other features that I mentioned, the independent suspension and, 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 and other attractive options for a, a car. So he did have a good idea. He had a lot of energy. And he honestly tried to set about to build a new car to introduce to to consumers and, and to the industry, but his, his effort foundered on, on the rocks of finances. I mean, he just couldn't raise the kind of money to go into mass production. He might, though, as I've written here, have gotten his vindication in at least a couple of ways. Despite the failure of his company, I mean, his dream died with the, 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 uh, the, the kind of financial and legal problems that he got into. Despite the failure of his company, though, he did have plans to build a new car. And he died, unfortunately, of lung cancer before he was ever able to uh, construct a factory in in Brazil he wanted to do this. But this car that he was planning to build looks a lot like a car that eventually did go into mass production. Anybody recognize this car or seen it on the roads? This is a Plymouth Prowler. It went into mass production in the 1990s. So he got vindication in in that way in terms of the the styling of this planned car. But that film, Tucker, The Man and His Dream, really elevated interest in the Tucker automobile and the Tucker story such that Tuckers today are extremely valuable. I mean, a well-conditioned Tucker will sell at auction for more than a million dollars. I mean, you're looking right here at millions of dollars worth of car. To give you an idea, it's been featured on Jay Leno's Garage, this Tucker was resting in a barn, I think in Ohio or in, in, in Washington State. And it went to auction. 
it, it, it couldn't run. I mean, it was missing parts, the engine didn't work, but even in the kind of condition it was in, it sold at auction for almost $800,000. I mean, imagine that. You have this old car that doesn't even work sitting in your barn, and it's worth almost $800,000. I mean, that speaks to how valuable tuckers have become today because of the, the interest that the Hollywood film generated. So in that respect, too, Tucker got his vindication. So he was a maverick automaker that tried to break into the auto manufacturing business. And I want to look at another maverick automaker, this guy. Anybody recognize him? I didn't think he'd recognize him, but I bet... All of you, or almost all of you, know his name. He worked for General Motors, and he was sort of a boy wonder in the early 1960s for General Motors because he was hitting cars out of the ballpark, really, in a lot of ways, because he was achieving success after success. Uh, for example, the, he, he was one of the champions of the Pontiac GTO muscle car, and this is him accepting a Motor Trend Award for the Pontiac GTO. And this was another one of his cars that he championed in the, later in the 1960s, the Pontiac Firebird. So these were very successful automobiles. He was really on the fast track at General Motors. People thought that he was being groomed eventually to be CEO of General Motors. But he felt straight-jacketed at General Motors. He didn't like the corporate culture there. He thought it was very restrictive and conservative. He, he was sort of a partier. He, he didn't like dressing in suits. He wore his hair a little longer. He dated models. And he felt that the restrictive, conservative, buttoned-up culture at General Motors was reflected in the automobile styling of General Motors cars, which he thought was stodgy. So he quit General Motors in 1973, and when he quit, he said that General Motors just isn't making the kind of cars that interest the public. And he vowed, I'm going to teach General Motors how to build automobiles. And so he got into a project to design a new car that he named after himself, and this is what the car looked like. Do you know his name now? He named it after himself. It was a, an eponymous car. Do you recognize this car at all, the DMC? What does DMC stand for? Delorean Eddie? Motor Company. Good. This is John DeLorean, the DeLorean Motor Company. And so it, it had many innovative features, just like Preston Tucker did with his car. You could see the, the gullwing doors and the stainless steel body that wouldn't rust. And he, unlike Tucker, actually got financial backing for the car. He entered into a partnership with the British government because it's to a, government, a government's advantage to try to back car makers because car making provides jobs. So he had a plant built in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and the car went into mass production, unlike with Tucker, and he was able to build 9,000 of these cars. Very much like Tucker, he was a tireless champion and promoter of his own automobile. And so you could see him trying to advertise his car and standing behind it, on top of it. And it was a good-looking car. It, um, it was sleek. It offered fairly good performance, although there were some reliability problems with it. But what happened to him and his car? Uh, it, I, he was able to produce 9,000 of them, as I mentioned. But after just about a year, he had to shut down his factories and stop producing. And what happened? Well, finances caught up with him also. Consumer tastes also. He was offering just one particular vehicle, not an array of different vehicles, like, uh, just like Tucker, just one one vehicle, not different models. And so to add insult to injury, uh, right after his car factory shut down, he was arrested for cocaine trafficking. And the charge against him was that he was trying to sell cocaine to raise money for his automobile company. And just like with Tucker, there was a trial, and the jury reached a verdict, not guilty, just like with Tucker. But his dream was finished, 
And financial and legal problems associated with this DeLorean car dogged him for the rest of his life. In fact, he had to declare personal bankruptcy in 1999. But in a lot of ways, Hollywood, just like with Tucker, might have saved him also because in 1985, we have the Back to the Future film appearing, which inextricably linked the DeLorean with the time machine. In fact, if you've seen the movie, there's a line in the movie where Marty McFly says to Doc Brown, Doc, do you mean to tell me you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? And Doc Brown says something like, well, if you're going to put a time machine in a car, you might as well do it with some style. So uh, the interest in DeLoreans increased because of the Back to the Future ended up being a trilogy of, of movies, and the car became really a collector's item. So in that respect, DeLorean might have had the last laugh as well and might have been saved by, by Hollywood in the same way that Preston Tucker was. But what's the takeaway lesson from what we've studied so far? What does history teach us about these maverick automakers? Well, they don't have a good track record of success. In fact, they fail. And they fail because they're trying to enter a business, auto manufacturing, that has such high capital and money costs, financial costs. You're subject to fickle consumer tastes often. You have problems, as I said, with supply chains and, chains and dealerships and all the complexities of automobile manufacturing and sales. It's a very difficult business to get into. And so these maverick automakers tend to be broken on the wheel, so to speak, of, of, of the, the, the very difficult nature of the enterprise that they're trying to get into. So this brings us to one last maverick, this guy. Who is this guy? You surely recognize him. Who is he? Ryan? Elon Musk. Okay, good. Elon Musk. And so he's trying to break into the automobile business as the co-founder and CEO of Tesla. And as we've gone over, history tells us that his prospects are not good. He, like Preston Tucker and John DeLorean, is tirelessly promoting his vehicles. And we see echoes of the DeLorean even in the gullwing doors of some Tesla models. And he has the Model S and the Model X, and he plans the Model 3, which will be sold at $35,000, which might bring the Tesla into the mainstream. Le just last night, Tesla unveiled its new uh, semi-trailer truck uh, that'll be electric-powered, so this might be a game-changer as well. But in the end, let's face it, Tesla is laboring in the shadow of failure. History does tell us that automobile makers, these maverick independent automobile makers who try to get into the business, fail. Yet, Tesla's been around for several years right now. I mean, Tesla's made more cars than Preston Tucker and John DeLorean combined. Last year, they made around 80,000 cars. That's way more than DeLorean and, and, and Tucker uh, put together. And Elon Musk has ambitious plans to ramp up mass production of cars to 200,000. It's still very small compared to, say, General Motors. Last year, General Motors produced 10 million cars worldwide. So, so again, 200,000 is just a, a, a sliver, a fingernail sliver compared to, to the production of the, the big three. But how can we explain the fact that Elon Musk, in contrast to these other mavericks, is actually getting a foothold or maybe a toehold in the automaking industry. I asked you guys to think about this question. What are some of your suppositions about why Elon Musk seems to be, seems to be doing okay so far with the promise of doing better in the future? Do you have any ideas about this? What is he doing differently or what's different about his background? Alexis? Well, he was a businessman and had a couple of other really good business deals before Tesla. And then as well as that, like, he's an inventor. He also, like, puts a lot of money towards Tesla that he already had from previous business. And he wants to be involved with things besides cars as well. Okay. Yeah, so he's got SpaceX going. And he was wealthy from the start. John DeLorean and Preston Tucker were not wealthy. I mean, Elon Musk is a billionaire with a B. Uh, he, he, he made, anybody know how he made his money originally? Eddie? Uh, he made a company with his brother when he was like 16, I think, and then he sold it. And yeah. 
And after that, it was history. Yeah, yeah. PayPal. Yeah. yeah. He, 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 I mean, he's a computer whiz. He's a real immigrant success story, too. I mean, he was born in South Africa, moved to Canada, and then the U.S. And it's, it's a marvelous story for an immigrant to make it this big in, in this country with, with SpaceX, well, PayPal and, and SpaceX, and also Tesla. And, and Tesla is making slowly inroads into, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the automobile manufacturing business, which is a very difficult business inherently to make inroads into. So it's, it's very impressive. So you start out with a CEO who has his own financial backing in that he's a billionaire. And this marks a contrast from some of the other mavericks that we looked at. So that's one plausible reason why Tesla seems to be Seem, seems to be holding its own so far. What, what are some other reasons? Tesla's stock is, is doing very well. Um, what are some other possible reasons to explain why Tesla has not gone the way of Tucker and DeLorean? At least not yet. Any other ideas? What about the nature of the car? What powers Tesla? Gasoline, diesel, Ryan? It's an electric car, so that just makes it much different and, in a way, more appealing to consumers with a taste for the future who want something different, not just like gasoline vehicles for the last century plus that have been what we've been using. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I, I, I mean, Elon Musk and Tesla have entered a market where essentially there's almost a blank slate. The other automobile makers are still dependent on internal combustion engines. And for people in the U.S. and worldwide who are more conscious about the environmental impact of automobiles, uh, the electric car is appealing. I mean, it promises perhaps the end to the internal combustion engine, and with that, less environmental impact, less of a carbon footprint, and less smog and smoke and pollution, less global warming perhaps, and so there's a, a, a reason to buy the Tesla as opposed to, to other cars that the consumers um, might feel attracted to. So, so there's that. He's, he, the, the, the very nature of what fuels Tesla cars as opposed to other automobiles attracts a segment of the population, and, and it's probably a growing segment of the population. What else? How else can we explain this? I mean, this is sort of a historical quandary, a dilemma that we're facing. Elon Musk and Tesla are sort of breaking the mold of, of Mavericks. Eddie? They kind of molded the car after like technology, like autonomous driving now is like their main selling point. Yeah, yeah. Technology is a big factor. I mean, this is a very advanced car. For that reason, it's very expensive, the, the S and the X models. But the Model 3 could possibly be a game changer. It might bring Tesla into the, the mid-range market, the more mainstream market. It might be, it may very well be that 10 years from now, some of us might own Tesla automobiles. I bet none of us right now own a, a Tesla. Yeah, it's a little out of our, our price range. But a decade from now, if Tesla is still around, we might be looking at more and more people, just like Henry Ford brought the Model T within range of average consumers, we might be looking at a, a vehicle that, that the mainstream consumer buys. And the technology, we're all enamored of technology. The te technology that goes into Tesla may be very conducive to driverless automobiles. That's what Elon Musk and Tesla have in mind with that tractor trailer uh, that they introduced uh, yesterday evening. To, to have these autonomous vehicles on the road. They want to start with that over long, long stretches, and that might really change the, the trucking industry. So, so, yeah, it appeals to our love of, of technology and, and um, perhaps driverless cars in the future. It also appeals to our love of technology in another way. Have any of you seen advertisements on television for Tesla? You know, in the 1950s, the car age that I was talking about earlier in the class, nine out of every ten ads on television was for automobiles. And there's still a lot of car ads on TV, maybe not that kind of fraction, but you don't see Tesla advertising. So how do they advertise? They try to lure consumers into their showroom, but there's also what today to advertise? Alexa? Social media. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you have social media. So you have different ways of disseminating news about a car, the attractiveness of a vehicle with, with, with social media that, that Preston Tucker and John DeLorean and, and other maverick automakers before Elon Musk 
did not avail themselves of, could not avail themselves of. So those are all important factors. Those are all great answers and, 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 and great suppositions. Any, any, anything else that might explain this? The, 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 the rise and, and continued endurance of Tesla? Uh, well, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they don't have dealerships. Like, they just have like stores, and you can just like go in there, like try them, like sit in the cars, and then you can like buy them from there. Yeah, there's a direct appeal to consumers, also with with Tesla. So, especially because you have an inherent attraction of this car to a particular segment of who are uh, of uh, um, auto buyers who are very loyal to this idea of green cars, uh, energy efficient cars. Um, does the government play a role? I mentioned that John DeLorean entered a partnership with the British government. And the British government gave him some financial backing, and that enabled him to mass-produce cars, unlike Preston Tucker. For energy efficiency, he gets some government subsidies to build the batteries, and um, that helps also. Uh, when, when your production is subsidized by the government, that gives you tax breaks and subsidies. So that, that lowers your, your overhead and, and your costs as, as well. Um, plus, you know, a lot of it is a good product, and consumer satisfaction with Tesla and their reliability rates pretty high. And ultimately, it's how good and how reliable a car you, you have. And that'll satisfy consumers and keep them coming back for more and, and keep them loyal to, to your brand. And, and that's important also to, to instill that kind of brand loyalty in whatever you're, you're trying to sell. Any other possible guesses? All right, I think we've covered most of them. So I think that covers it for, for today. Thanks a lot for coming today. And we'll see all of you on, on Monday. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. Be sure to check out our Book Notes Plus podcast. This week's program includes a portion of a Book Notes conversation with the late Harvard professor Derek Bell. He talks about his book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. <laughs>